Hi everyone, Ryan here, Ion Capital Solutions. Hope you're doing well. So today we were supposed to have our Facebook Live presentation. Unfortunately, we learned a valuable lesson live, and that was do not use Facebook's broadcasting system to go live. Instead, use a third-party broadcasting system to plug into Facebook so that we're able to do everything effectively that we wanted to do in the first place. So with that being said, we were unable to go live on Facebook after trying a few times. We did have quite a few people show up, so... Um, <clears throat> A humbling day to say the least. But with that being said, we did convert over into a group call on Google Meet. We did record our presentation. And obviously, if you're watching this video, you're about to watch that presentation. So without wasting any more time talking about setup and trial and error, here's a presentation you all logged on to, uh, to view. Thank you so much for your uh, following us, your viewership, and, and of course, your interest in ION. Um, let's kick things off. Thanks. All right, so let's kick things off. For any of our viewers here watching this video, we did attempt to go live on Facebook today and it did not work out so well. We had a lot of technical difficulties with getting it started, so we'll work on that for next time, but we are gonna walk you through the presentation here. We're recording, so obviously if you're watching this, we did end up getting the information over to you. So welcome to our free loan broker training here. We're gonna be walking you through the high level of business loan brokering, more specifically commonplace in the loan brokering space. We're gonna be discussing some loan calculation on the business funding side, the real estate investment side, the marketing aspect. We're gonna be talking about some other bits as well as sharing information about us here at Ion Capital Solutions. So with that being said, we're gonna kick off. I'm here with Christopher Van Buren. Christopher, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, thank you. Terrific, terrific. So I guess with that being said, let's kick things off. Let's dive into the first slide. So what's the best way to get leads? This is a very common question when it comes to business loan brokering, right? Anybody who's either active in the space trying these things or looking to get set up and established for the first time, you're looking what direction to go. So let's review these options and then we'll let you know what our recommendations are and what, what how we practice here at ION. So buying business leads is where we'll start in the top left right here, right? Buying business funding leads, right? Dialing for dollars. You'd be buy some pop crumb leads or whatever from a age leads company, whether they're 30, 60, 90 days old, you pull out your phone, right? You, you, you pound the phone, you make your three to 500 calls a day, call as many businesses as you can, get somebody interested in funding, right? The problem with this methodology is the vast majority of people are doing this, right? Christopher and I have a lot of experience calling and calling and cold calling. And we know, and anybody who's active in this space knows just how often these business owners get calls like this. And the reality is endless solicitation becomes a pest to the, to the uh, client. And what happens as well is that this data is actually uh, uh, redistributed and sold to a lot of brokers. So what you end up with is very high contention files, as well as what we call in the business repeat offenders. These are people who frequently borrow money, have likely defaulted or missed payments in the past, have poor credit. And so getting them funded is more and more of a challenge every single time, right? And so that's the issue with buying leads. Do we recommend buying leads and cold calling? Absolutely not. For So for anybody who's out there cold calling every day, you'll be happy to know there is in fact a better way. So with that being said, let's talk about paid advertising, right? We know what it is to dial for dollars and buy leads and go that direction, but a lot of people want to hop on social media, start thinking about audience building, start thinking about um, running ads. Lord knows we've done it, running ads on Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube and Google and and it sounds good, right? You're going to position an ad. It's a shotgun approach. Get it out in front of a ton of business owners in the hopes that they will then be willing to apply with you for funding. The problem with this is it's quite expensive, quite expensive. Um, and it's really more for branding. You know, you're trying to essentially let people know who you are and consistently run ads. There's usually a trial and error period where it takes anywhere from six months to a year to just find the right type of advertising for you, the right type of ad that connects with an audience 
the right kind of reach and targeting the right audience, a specific audience based on their demo, their geo, whatever it may be. There's trial and error with cost involved. And so anybody starting up a business that's not cash flowing and putting money out the door, understand it's going to be an expensive startup cost. How many of of you have actually done just that, right? And put set aside $50,000, whatever it is, to waste on building your business through trial and error and trying to make it all work. Building a business, something we're gonna talk about in a little bit here. There's posting, right? You could create posts and, and create a group for yourself or on, on social media, such as Facebook, right? Or even off your main profile and, and have a lot of friends and then create large posts or join groups, right? If you like funding real estate investors or business owners, you can join a group, create a post, get people to comment with their contact information. You offer funding options. Here's what you can offer, right? Drop your email, your phone number. I'll reach out to you. I'll let you know what we can do for you. And as much as that might sound like a good idea, what you're really doing is providing public information to a ton of brokers just like yourself who are going to solicit to and call that those clients. And just because you have interested parties there doesn't necessarily mean that those people are qualified, right? So where sure you may be able to connect with some people like that, using that avenue, probably not the best way to go about it. There's SEO. I think without even diving into that, that's that can be quite complicated. You're usually going to have to get an agency involved. They're going to want their fee plus whatever your cost of operation is. Again, paid, not the right direction. There's live transfer leads. Everybody seems to think that those are the best leads right up until they pay for them and actually get them. So that's essentially having a, a company in another country where they're going to just pound the phones and call people all day, get a business owner, owner on the phone, try and get them to stay on the phone until while they're dialing you until they get you on the phone, then they transfer that lead over to you, which you end up with is a very angry customer who doesn't know who they're talking to, why that per they've been called 15 times that day, and you're paying 20, 30, 40, even $50 for that live transfer lead. And very rarely do they want to talk to you. And if they do want to talk to you, they're not properly qualified. So there's usually an issue with the file. Now, all of these methods can work. You may find some interest, but they're not reliable. Not reliable. Cold calling can be reliable if you have thousands of dollars every month to spend on leads. You're willing to sit there and make three to 500 calls a day or fill a calling center and have people pound the phones all day. You can make that work. But anything short of that, it won't happen. So with that being said, we do things quite differently here at ION. We use organic multi-platform lead generation. We grow our own leads organically. We're not paying for solutions. We're not running ads. We're not buying leads. We're not cold calling. We're warming up leads organically on social media, but in an unintended way. When I say unintended, if you were to go on Facebook and you were to generate leads, essentially what you would be doing is you would be generating leads, uh, um, uh, or excuse me, you would be running an ad. Right. So you would say, OK, I want to, you know, I'm going to run an ad. It's going to reach this many people. Here's how many clicks, views I want to have. And there's a dollar amount associated with that. Right. Or you're going to post. You create a post. Then you can put money behind that post and boost that post. This is the way that Facebook wants you to use their, pl their platform. That's the intended way. If you were to go on YouTube, right, they want you to run ads and incorporate Google. And so you're using Google ads and you have to get that all set up, which is very com complicated and it's expensive. These are platforms that you can utilize to gather leads, but there's an intended way that these companies want you to use their platforms. We do not do that. We operate in between the lines organically and we connect with people in a way where it's a warm conversation. We understand where to go, where these people are congregating, and then we're communicating with them. We know they want our services. So by, by the time we hop on the phone, they're happy to talk to us. Ever hear the expression, like shooting fish in a barrel, right? Essentially, we have the fish finder. We know where they are. We're standing over the bow of the boat, and boom. <laughs> That's how we're catching our fish. Instead of casting a wide net, right, or trying to figure out the right bait. It's all about a specific workflow and understanding how to actually connect with people. So if you're watching this video and you want to know how we're actually doing this, 
Obviously, we're not going to share that that over, over at the training video here. If you want to learn more about it, you can schedule a call, learn more about ION, our programs, and how we do things. But one of the things I will share with you is that we are emailing. We do have email campaigns established and set up. We are using sequences to follow up with our clients automatically. We are using... Uh, deliverability services to make sure that our emails are actually landing in clients' inboxes. Um, spam is a serious problem, um, and and it's becoming more strict and stringent every single day. Um, and so, understanding how to properly navigate that space and utilize the right tools and how to put together an effective campaign can make all the difference when connecting with people. Now, this is not the only way that we're we're generating leads. It's multi-platform organic lead generation, but this is just one of those avenues. Christopher, you're quite good with the email sequencing and getting it established. You've run a lot of campaigns. Can you speak a little bit more to this methodology and how it can be helpful to connect with our audience? So, I mean, with emails, I mean, if you think about it, if we open up our email boxes right now, how many of us are receiving messages from companies, products, and services that we have long forgotten about? And literally with the, uh, the ability to use technology and have these autoresponder programs, what, what these companies realize is that if I keep on sending you messages, when my message resonates with you, you're likely to open and take action. So the truth is, I don't know necessarily when someone's ready to make a move, but I want to be in a position to be there when they are making a move. And the best way to do that and stay in front of your people and generate the greatest ROI is by constantly sending out your, your, your messaging. And not, and not all of it should be marketing specific. It could just be a hey, touching basis, seeing how you're doing. Again, when if we know the people behind the email address and realize that these are people, what I'm trying to do is connect with people. And so I'm going to send solicitations about what I do, but I'm also going to try to do things that kind of engage a conversation, give them a reason to talk to me. And email is by far one of the most effective ways of reaching out and meeting the public. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said, Christopher. And so one of the ways that we're connecting with our audience is this avenue and being able to set it up and establish and keep following up with that person and making sure that they're seeing that email is just one of the things that you'll have to focus on in a marketing campaign, domain health and having an effective domain that will ensure that your emails are being read, that you're not going to end up on spam lists or being blocked from servers. It's just a piece of the puzzle in building your business as a business loan broker. So again, the topic of building a business, something we'll touch on a little bit here. Um, it can be a real can of worms if, if you know, you're not familiar with these things. So just a little bit of a window into the future there and one of the, the challenges that you can face. But anyway, this is, that'll do it for our marketing uh, uh, part of the presentation. If you'd like to learn more, um, we can simply, uh, you can schedule a call with us. We'll talk about it. We'll let you know how our program works and what we can do to, to help you learn more about an effective marketing campaign. With that being said, I want to hit some MCA funding hacks. There's, there's a, a lot of you that really get your start in merchant cash advance and trying to establish a business loan brokerage or simply a referral business for yourself to where you can find interested parties forward them to the lender and earn a commission, right? And so cash advance is what everybody knows, high interest, short-term loans with daily and weekly payments, connect with the business, right? See if they need working capital, essentially, right? That's the beginnings of most business loan brokers' journeys. And so let's talk about it, right? There's this expectation out there, especially online, that, hey, it's fast funding, it's easy money, anybody can do it, Um all you got to do is run an ad or buy some leads, find some interested parties, gather their bank statements and application forward to the lender and congratulations. You're a business loan broker. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's just it's not that simple. That's that's not how it works. So um, anybody who's got this in mind, um, I, I, it's not going to happen that way. You may get lucky and strike gold and find somebody who just needs a quick loan and bang, you, com you, you earn a commission. And that's great as a side hustle, but there won't be consistency there. It's a little bit more involved. We're going to talk a bit about that here in just a second. But anybody with that mindset of, right, you're going to be a millionaire. All you got to do is forward to the lender. Your mission crucial part 
of the of the puzzle and that is qualifying clients and underwriting files that come in and that's not the lender's job that's your job as a business loan broker so very very important but with that being said let's dive into an example okay and first i have one slide i forgot to mention is expectation is the root of all heartache shakespeare okay terrific terrific quote uh definitely speaks to the point here right having this false expectation this preconceived notion that it's going to be that simple and that easy is going to be a problem and unfortunately we have competitors out there who are teaching people this that it's just that simple and it's not it's not so what it really comes down to in business funding is loan repayment and can they afford it or not is the bottom line that's the main reality here and as business loan brokers it's our job when connecting with these people to understand can they afford the loan right Understanding right out of the gate that lenders will allow roughly 16 to 18 percent of a business owner's monthly gross revenue to be paid out to lenders for repayment of a loan. And this includes their own loan, right? Meaning that if a client already had a loan, how much of their monthly gross revenue is going out the door in repayment? And then if the lender's considering giving them another loan behind that, well, what do those add up to, right? And so, Understanding and measuring for ourselves out of the gate, can a client afford the loan is everything. We need to have our calculators out on that first initial call. If we don't know these things and we just forward to the lender, we have no idea if what we're spending time on phone calls and doc trade and submission and back and forth and follow ups, if any of that's even worth our time. And if we're doing that and we have a bad file, we're literally wasting our time. There's no monetary value associated. Right. I mean, let's look at an example of a business loan. A business will need enough revenue to support repayment of a loan based on the allowance of 16 to 18 percent. OK, that's our example. So we're talking about a cash advance here. Right. It's a hundred thousand dollar loan. The average factor is a one three eight, meaning there's 38 percent interest on top of it. Right. So 38 percent interest broker points is eight points. That's what we would be charging. Right. So please understand that you're going to have the principal, right, which is the loan amount, the interest, right? But then we also have our points. That's what we're charging. That's how we earn as brokers. So when you take 38% and you add another eight points on top of it, or 8%, you get to 46%, okay? A 1.46 factor or a 46% interest rate overall for the payback, okay? What that means is that this client will borrow $100,000 and the cost of that $100,000 will be 146000 Okay, so with that being said, again, $100,000 paying back $146,000. We need to understand if the client can afford that payback. Well, first we need to understand essentially and measure the percentage of, of affordability, right? So $100,000 in revenue, that means that they can afford roughly 16 to 18% in monthly payments at a maximum, right? So in other words, 16 to $18,000 if they were paying back 100,000, except it's 146,000, not 100,000. So it's gonna be more than 16 to $18,000 in repayment. But with that being said, we need to first understand the average term of a loan. Well, merchant cash advances are generally within 20, 12 months. The average term is between six and eight months. So for this example, we'll use eight months, okay? So with that being said, all you do is take the payback, 146,000, you divide it by eight months, right? And you're gonna get $18,250 a month, okay? So that's 18.25% of their monthly gross revenue. Okay, so can they afford it? Yes, they can afford it at an absolute maximum. They can afford to borrow if they're grossing $100,000 a month, they can afford to borrow $100,000 paying back 146,000 at an absolute maximum they could afford that payment schedule. Okay? But do they have other loans? Right? Do they have other loans that they're currently paying for? At 18% of the maximum, if they already have 8% of their monthly gross revenue being pay, being going out the door, paying off other loans, then they only can afford 10% of their monthly gross revenue in repayment. So could they afford the, the loan in that case? If 8% is already tied up with another loan? Nope, they can't. So if a client's asking for that much money, it's your job to tell them you can't afford that much money unless we're going to 
pay off that existing position and put you in a true first position where they can essentially pay off their other loan and then use the remainder of the funds to fuel their business. So sure, we can give you that money, but you're going to have to use that money to pay off your other loan before you can use the rest for your business, whatever it may be. If this is sounding complicated, it should. That's the point. It's understanding this is the complexity around business funding, merchant cash, advanced term loans, understanding affordability and how it all connects and how it works. Okay. The other thing to understand is that there's other factors that weigh into this, such as revenue, right? If we're looking at revenue with a client, we pull up their bank statements and we see deposits at the top and it says they're doing 100000 a month in, in deposits. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's revenue. So we need to look at the line items and ascertain for ourselves, how does this actually work? right? What is revenue? What is a, a suspicious wire? For instance, if they have a wire from Blue Capital Funding for $25,000. That's not revenue. That's a loan, right? So we know their $100,000 in deposits deduct $25,000 because they don't have a hundred grand in revenue. They have 75 grand in revenue. So that's going to affect everything I just showed you there, right? Understanding that... <clears throat> Is there stability in cash flow, right? Are there excessive negative days, overdraws? That's going to play its part, right? Um, <clears throat> are there other accounts? You're going to see uh, uh, wires transfers from other accounts. There's a transfer from account ending in these four digits. What is that account? Where is that money coming from? We need to see that account now. Is that actual revenue or are they just moving money back and forth between accounts trying to make it look like revenue? These are the things that the lender is going to be doing. Their underwriting team is going to be looking at. It's our job as business loan brokers to know how this stuff works so that we can ascertain for ourselves whether or not we have a deal, whether or not they can afford it, whether or not their expectations are realistic. And if we don't set that client straight up front and let them know what's available to them, what's not available to them, we may be shooting ourselves in the foot. We may be putting ourselves in a position of... Uh, uh, wasting our own time because they'll never agree to the terms. They think they deserve something that they're not going to get. They have unrealistic expectations, so they're going to be upset and bothered. And then we believe that we're doing something wrong or there's something the lender's doing wrong or whatever it is. And reality is you, you just don't understand how the deal really works. And so it's creating a whole lot of chaos and confusion. Us as business loan brokers, it's our job to be the glue to hold all of this together. Okay. So there's a little bit about business loan brokering, merchant cash advance more specifically how calculations work, um, understanding the numbers. If you want to learn more about it, there's a bunch of free trainings on our YouTube channel. Uh, and of course, you can schedule a call with us to learn more about how we do that here at ION. So with that being said, Christopher now is going to walk you through real estate investment funding calculations, how to run an effective uh, 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 call with a client, understanding what questions to ask, how to work the numbers, Real estate investment funding is a very, very uh, lucrative and active loan brokering space. The products are a lot more advantageous to the clients. The interest is far, far lower. We're not dealing with the toxic merchant cash advance. There's lots of ways to earn a commission. And hopefully you'll all learn that you don't just have to push a high interest short term loan with a daily payment to make money in this space. There's lots of ways to do that. So with any anyway, uh, Christopher, please take it away. We'll start off with the three qualifying questions, and then I'll dive into your standard rehab loan calculation slides that you've created. All right. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah. So basically the key to you'll see within business funding, real estate funding, um, anytime we're looking at a person requesting cash for any reason, we really want to kind of analyze what they're requesting and make sure it makes sense. Um, so just in business funding, there's a set of questions you want to know, fundability. It, it works the same way in real estate. We want to make sure that what a person's requesting, that they have the experience and capabilities of handling that project. And as consultants, our job is to lead them in directions where they can have the most success. So rule of thumb, when I'm talking with someone and they're talking about they're interested in real estate, one of the main things I want to get in a roughly idea is, is about how much cash they're working with. Because in real world terms, money makes money. So when someone's saying I want to do a project, automatically in the back of my mind, my simple math is if you tell me what the purchase price is, you tell me what your rehab budget is, 
that's your total cost. And I'm going to say, okay, you need to cover 30% of that number. And the way that 30% is allocated will be uh, between down payment, closing costs, reserves, and the ability to start your rehab. Because the truth of the matter is when a person does a rehab loan, the bank doesn't say, well, here, take the money and do whatever you want. They get the money, they get repaid money they put out. So when I'm looking at someone's fundability, I want to make sure that they can afford the project, not only the down payment, not only their closing costs, but can they make, could they handle making mortgage payments for six to 12 months? Do they have 10% of their overall budget to start the rehabs? Do they have money to get the contractor going? Those are questions we I'm going to find out. And that's why when I look at a deal, when they tell me their numbers, I'm automatically in my mind, boom, 30% of that equals X. So I already have an earmark on what they need beforehand. Second thing that we're looking for um, in this example is um, what's the experience look like? So with an experience, I, I, I use the analogy platinum, gold, and silver. Um, the more experienced you are, the more of a proven entity that you know what you're doing, the bank's going to give you favorable, more favorable treatment. If you have limited experience, the bank's going to see you as a higher risk and as a result, charge you accordingly to your risk profile. So experience is a key factor. And when I say experience, I'm looking for what happened in the last three years. We're only going back a small window of time. We're not dealing with someone who's had rental properties for 10 years. I need to know what you've done in the last three years because obviously the market has grown, cha changed and adapted over the last several years. And that's what I'm using. And that's what I give weight to. And then uh, the final thing, as far as how hungry, and again, we all have a limited amount of time when I'm talking to someone on the phone, are we talking about an active deal right now? Because I realize that I only have so many days and <laughs> hours in a day like everybody else. If we don't have a deal right now, then I, in my mind, I know to put them in a different bucket. That bucket means let me follow up with them. I don't need to spend as much time. The urgency for them is not as high. So I don't need to give them urgency at that moment. I just got to build rapport and then nurture them. But what I want to find out is if we have a property right now, then we have a timeline. We have a deadline to meet. And I want to use that deadline when I'm doing my negotiations with them, explaining my funding program to them, that how my funding is going to hit their timeline. And that urgency is my urgency. And we're working in tandem. And I'm also protecting my time because I'm putting, I'm giving energy to the most, the highest priority thing when it occurs. So that way I'm not burning myself out. All right. And then I think we'll roll right into just kind of effective uh, running a consult. Literally, I, I find a lot of people, you know, look at lead generation. These are not just random data points. Really, I don't, instead of going shotgun, be an assassin. Learn the people you deal with. You don't have to deal with a lot of people to make money. But if you're, if you work and get to know who's behind the email address, who's behind the phone number, you're going to have more than enough opportunities to win business and be successful in this uh, industry. Uh, these are real people, not just email addresses. And it, the quicker you can get to learn who they are as a person or as a business person, the sooner you're gonna be able to uh, have success in uh, doing your brokering. I'm sorry, doing two things. All right, so property one. So let's go with the first questions uh, that I usually ask. Do we have a property in mind? If not, do we have a zip code on where you'd like to do your work at? Because what I'm looking for is different properties have, are, are, are looked at more favorably than others. If the property is in a rural state, I can kind of cut that, that, maybe that interview a little bit shorter because I know I don't do a lot of things in a rural area. Or if I'm looking at an area that say has a high crime rate, I realize that I might be limited into lenders that might want to deal with a certain geography based off of their crime score. So again, it, knowing where our, an investor works at gives me a lot of insight on how I'm going to submit and what lenders I'm going to go to. Because again, there's a, there's, there's a lender for every buyer, <laughs> but my job is to know what, what that lender is. Next questions are purchase price, 
renovation budget, property value, a, uh, ARV. Well, what am I buying it for? What's my rehab budget? Those two numbers are my total costs. Usually the current value of the property is the same as the purchase price, but sometimes that's not the case. <laughs> um, and then finally the ARV, because the ARV, I need to know what the property is going to be worth after you repair it, because I'm doing all my math on the first two sets of numbers and that last number are where I do my, my, my math at. We can go to the next slide. So simple formula, tell me your purchase price. I add your rehab budget. That's your total cost, total loan to cost. What am I really spending out of pocket? I don't care if the house is worth 300. If you're buying it for a hundred thousand with 50,000 out of the rehab, my numbers are based off of 150, not 300,000. So we only lend on your true costs, not if there's a additional equity, we don't lend on the additional equity. We, we, we lend on what you're spending at the, on contract. And then that's the first equation. The this, this back half is that I look at the total cost of the project and I look at the ARV. And then when I look at the ARV, I take a percentage of that. And what I'm looking for is to see what which number is smaller because <laughs> that's what the bank's going to lend. They'll lend up to the LTC to a certain value or the ARV, whichever's lower. So th th there's two sides of the, there's two sides of the scale. The bank chooses the safest part, the safer side. So here's an example of uh, you know you can kind of run to. You might want to take a screenshot of this. Um, you know, I'm sure if you join our, our program, you'll also have access to this. Um, but you know, quite simply. Purchase price is 200, rehab is 70, total cost is 270. ARV is 350. So in these calculations, I'm able to use 85% loan to cost or 70% of the LTV. So when I'm looking at how my loan is based, my loan is going to be based off of the 270 times 85%. That's the loan amount that I can get off of cost. Then I take a look at what I'm doing from there is from that 229, the bank always holds an escrow 100% of the rehab budget. So 229 minus 70, 159. Um, so when we look at 159 divided by the 200 sale price, we see that it, it falls within the 80% bracket. When we look at the LTV ARV calculation, 229 divided by 350, we see we're at 65%. So when we look at this overall equation, we know that this will gr be green light on either side of the lender's equation because the 229 loan amount is supported both by the cost estimate of the work and the after repair value of the work. And then it's just real simple. You take your purchase price minus what money the bank's lending you towards the purchase, you subtract those two, and that tells you how much equity you need. In this case, they need $40,000. So real simple. If you look at it a couple of times, play around with the numbers, you know, play around with the calculations, you'll, you'll kind of get the hang of it. But if you have questions, you know, when you're, you're a part of the team I on, you know, you, you, you're, you're uh, uh, paired up with a mentor and we'll help kind of go over those numbers and get you real comfortable with calculating those figures kind of like in your head. <laughs> Absolutely. Which is a huge part of being a business loan broker, whether you're looking at business funding or here, real estate investment funding. Make no mistake about it. You have got to understand how the numbers work. You don't need to be a mathematician. You just need to know your formulas, understand what makes a deal, breaks a deal. That makes all the difference as a business loan broker. It's not just qualifying a client with questions. It's working the numbers as well. If we don't do those things and we just forward deals to the lender, it's gambling. Might as well take a bag of quarters, go to Vegas, put it in the slot machine, pull the slot and hope your winning numbers come up. And that's not a business model, right? So with that being said, there's a few other slides here. Christopher, do you want to hit these as well or can we skip over these? I mean, I mean, they're just kind of basic things. FICO score. Uh, no matter how we look at it, FICO rules the world. <laughs> and the better your FICO score is, the better your pricing is. Um, banks have uh, minimums and minimum requirements. Obviously, if you're on the lower end of a FICO, FICO scale, you're going to have a higher rate. So again, when we're talking to people and having these conversations, if they tell me that they have an issue with their number or their number's low, my job right then and there is to kind of let them know, well, because of that, you're going to be in one of the lower tiers. And so you can expect a little bit, you're going to pay a little bit more because of where you're at right now. So even before I give them the true quote, 
and already preparing them in their heart and mind, this is not going to be as cheap as compared to if you had a 700 FICO score. So I, again, managing the expectations before I go in for the kill. So I'm using everything they tell me to sell them on what to sell them a solution or to provide them a solution. I don't really sell. I consult. I I, I give solutions. Um, then we want to know what your exit strategies are. Are you flipping it? Is this a buy and hold? Is the refi? Each one of those have different variables, and we want to make sure that you can succeed in your exit strategy because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the client has success in finishing their their project. And then the cash reserves almost go back to that first question. 30% of whatever the number is, is usually what I earmark to make sure they have enough liquidity. You can't buy a million dollar property with $10,000 is, is basically uh, what that breaks down to. Yeah, absolutely. And so for any questions regarding this information, as Christopher mentioned before, you have a mentor here at ION who you can is responsible for this information, who understands it quite well. Christopher is one of our mentors. Um, so, you know, don't feel like all this knowledge has to be yours right off the bat. And that's really the point we're making here is there's a lot that goes into this and a lot as business loan brokers that we have to be responsible for. You have to choose. Do you want to build a business or do you want to learn the business? Here at ION, our students are able to, instead of build a business, simply plug in hours, go live into the marketplace week one and work on deals with real clients earning real commissions while being paired with the mentor and leveraging support out of the gate so that you don't necessarily need to be the expert to start earning money and accruing knowledge through experience. And that's really the best way to learn as opposed to putting all that on hold and learning everything first or trying to build a business and get it to function and then try and learn all this after the fact. Or Many people go down that road and become very frustrated. It's why we created our program. We, we service that need. So if anybody's watching this video right now, considers to themselves for a second well this is a lot of information this is new information to me this seems a bit frustrating or a bit complex or whatever it is take a step back and realize rome wasn't built in a day neither christopher nor myself just woke up one morning and all this knowledge was ours it, it took time you don't need to be a rocket scientist you just need to commit yourself to it you need to go through the bumps in the road you need to learn over time you'll accrue the knowledge you need we've both been doing this for a very long time it's why we're able to speak to these points so articulately and, and pull from experience, which is why it just flows, right? Well, with that being said, there is a smarter way to do this, as I just alluded to. You don't need to actually build a business. We do not recommend building a business. The whole, you know, there's other programs out there that'll say anyone can be a business loan broker. Just build a website and sign up with some lenders and run an ad or buy some leads and cold call and find some interested parties and forward to the lender and congratulations, you're a loan broker. I'm sorry, but that those guys are completely full of it. That is not the profession of business loan brokering. We need to provide expert consultation to our clients. We need to properly vet those clients, them as business owners, their entity itself, their financials, their cash flow, their assets, their liquidity, the deal itself. We need to calculate affordability. This is what our lender partners are expecting of us so that we submit good deals to them that can be funded. What they don't want is for us to just to, to give any old person who says, I need money. And we say, sure, no problem. Send me your bank statements and application and just forward to the lender and hope that the deals work works out. That wastes everybody everybody's time. It creates all kinds of confusion. And trying to build a business around that and buy an expensive CRM and build a website and try and get set up with the lenders and all the agreements and get all that established and then pay for leads and cold call and reach out to clients. It, it really, it's like trying to perform surgery with a blindfold on, you know? I mean, imagine if I told you for a minute that anyone can be a surgeon, just go get a white coat and some surgical equipment and go find some sick people on the street and bring them back home and start cutting them open and cut out the cancer. I mean, when you think about it that way, it's kind of ridiculous, you know? And so don't try and build a business. Don't try and operate a business without experience. You need to be surrounded with experience and support. If we wanted to get involved in the insurance business with no experience, we'd go take a job. We start at entry level. We learn how it works. We work our way through different departments. We all know that to be true. That's indicative of the way life works. Now, we've worked out a system here at IAM where we can streamline that process. You can go through all of that experience and training while earning money. 
it's not a job, right? You're not being locked in anything. There's no exclusivity or anything like that. But it's an expedited journey for you to learn front-end marketing, front-end sales, back-end underwriting and processing, team management, data management, lender management negotiation, client management negotiation and sales, how a brokerage functions and operates, all the nuance surrounding these things. You're surrounded with support. You have a mentor working with you and your clients on deals. You're earning while you're learning. You're active in the marketplace right away. You're generating leads for free. This is what you want to learn. This is the business. And through experience, you will accrue knowledge. And that's the best way to learn. So if this interests you, um, please reach out, schedule a call. Um, so sorry again for those of you who watched this video and you tried to join our live presentation on Facebook. The lesson that Christopher and I learned is do not try go live on Facebook utilizing their live software. Instead, we should be using a third party broadcast system and plugging in and that way we'll get what we want. So um, trial by error, isn't that the point? We've just, we've learned that ourselves. So everybody learned a bit of a lesson today. But with that being said, that's going to do it for this uh, this call. Christopher, thanks again so much for being with us today and helping helping us, walking us through those uh, standard loan calculations. Any other bits of information you want to share before we log off? No, I just, you know, I'm just, I'm, you know, looking forward to working with the, the people who are ready to take action. Uh, we, we really do lay out, not just say a blueprint, but we really give you action items. And if you, if you're, if you're true to the items that we show you and put those into place, you'll get all the support and you'll see tremendous levels of success. Absolutely. Well said, Christopher. Thanks, everybody. Good luck on your deals. Good luck in your loan brokering journey. We're only a phone call away. Thanks for your time. We'll catch you in the next video.